to control yourself, to not get too greedy because when, when we start to get too high, we sometimes look down on people and we sometimes misuse our power. So it's kind of like control your senses and control yourselves. God's like control yourself, don't get too egotistical. So it's kind of like we can remember those things, those important things like always give, always be compassionate and always have some self-control. So as, as our different, cause we've got the seeds of everything inside of us. So it's like those three things are pretty great things to remember on the path. That's Ryan Lear and you're listening to the Active Vegetarian Podcast. Welcome friends to the Active Vegetarian Show. My name is Nikki and together with Susanna, we are the founders of Active Vegetarian, authors of the Vegan Weight Loss Manifesto, personal health and fitness coaches who love helping people become a better being. Susanna and I have been following a plant-based lifestyle for over two decades, and it has honestly been a transformational journey. These life-changing results inspired us to dive deeper into educating ourselves on the power of whole food, plant-based nutrition, and the positive impact it can make on all areas of our life. Over the years, our passion has evolved to coaching others towards achieving their own goals and optimal health, and we hope to help you as well. It is our mission to inspire, motivate, and improve people's lives through healthy, active, plant-based living. We share personal experiences, stories, tips, advice, and interviews from influential health experts to help you discover how you can improve your life and live each day healthier, happier, and fitter. Thank you for spending your time with us. Now let's get the show started. beautiful friends this is Rosanna and I hope that you're well and managing to stay optimistic and healthy during this interesting time of global pandemic. Nick and I are doing fine and we've been enjoying many aspects of self-isolation and have put our focus mostly on personal growth and self-care. We've been enjoying reading more books, learning new skills, writing, spending more time on our yoga mats, visiting with nature whenever possible and of course, spending more creative time in the kitchen. So all in all, we've really felt uh, very blessed. Uh, After all, just the fact that we are safe and healthy is a privilege that many people don't have right now. I have to admit that we also had some dark days over the past 10 weeks, days when we feel stress of this whole situation come down on us. There has been some anger, frustration, and even anxiety. And perhaps you can relate to that on some level. After all, it's not always easy to navigate all those changes that we are experiencing right now with courage and grace. Fortunately, there are people in our lives who help guide us back to our center, who remind us that deep down we are all calm, graceful, and connected beings. And today we have the privilege to introduce you to one of these brilliant beings. His name is Ryan Lear and Ryan is a friend, mentor, and really one of our favorite people. He's a teacher, student, father, basketball player, founder of One Yoga Studios, and really a gift to humanity. Today we explore the power of regular yoga practice with Ryan and how it can help us find peace in our modern day life. We hope that you enjoyed the interaction as much as we did. And as a little side note, this episode was recorded via Zoom and you can watch it go down on YouTube. It's really worth it. Ryan shows us around his little sanctuary and uh, it's really a privilege to be invited into his presence. So enjoy, my friends. Hello, Ryan. Really good to have you here. So thank you for agreeing to, to do this with us today. My honor to be invited. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, I'm going to start off. I'm going to go deep. First off, first question. Curious, how do you define yoga? And also, how would you describe it to somebody who maybe has never experienced it before? Okay. To me, yoga is freedom. Um, Yoga is focus, freedom. Yoga is truth. Um, and yoga is acceptance and love 
to me. When I would explain, try to explain to people what yoga is, I would say it's a practice of coming home, like to the calm where you don't need to worry and stress. Um, it's like a mental, physical calm and centering. Um, so if I was to try to like get someone to practice yoga, say, hey, this is a way that you can get to the very center of yourself and get clear and calm and collected. And maybe if you're into spirituality, it's like a way to connect with the source of all life or of God, uh, to connect with God or the spark of divinity that we are. I feel like it's good for anybody, like whether they want to become more skillful in something, whether they're an athlete or a musician, because yoga is skill in action and like refining and getting centered. So um, for somebody who wants to get closer to their spirituality, it's a way of being with the spirit or with the breath for people who want to um, get fit and healthy it's a and like ther therapy you want to they have a sore neck or a sore back yoga can be so many things for so many different people and it's kind of like the saying god helps those who help themselves if you do the work usually like the yoga gives back tenfold almost it's like if you dedicate yourself to it it supports in a way such a supportive thing i don't i don't know what i would do without it especially with all the stress of everyday life and especially with the time we're in right now you say the work of yoga what does the dedication look like yeah well i guess dedication is different for each person because you know the highest yogis are the doctors and the nurses who are serving humanity and the nature and the animals like the like that's yoga of service some people have the luxury to have time to do asana practice like or or the poses it's a it's a yoga like so yoga can be service and it can be actually doing practices like breathing deep and setting your body so i really believe a daily practice unless people are super enlightened already like and don't need to do the work to get clear then i think it's so important to have a daily routine whether you meditate do postures breathing and meditation ideally and then before the postures and the meditation and the breathing is the every day you want to try to be as compassionate as possible as truthful as generous as moderate like but even moderation in moderation and mm -hmm. to um, let go rather than to be greedy there's like a yama and niyama are the path as part of yoga so i feel like it's important just in case that people don't know because you know before i got into yoga i thought it was just stretching and and postures and holding poses but it's so far beyond that but nothing again like in them you can get to that too you can like the goal of the postures is so you can sit still and be receptive to the to to the source i believe you know i've how been on this thing go ahead go ahead i'm wondering how did you discover yoga you know in high school i was really into basketball and i was using yoga um, more conscious body scanning, relaxation, and meditation to try to get into like my peak performance level. And then I got a taste of the philosophy in a religious studies course. And so in high school, I got introduced to the practice in university and just a touch in high school into the philosophy. And then after I finished my basketball days, I really just gave the, the, I used to spend every day playing basketball from the time I was 12 till 27, like every single day 
thinking, dr dreaming, sleeping, everything yoga or everything basketball. And then thankfully, um, I that passion and, and devotion went from basketball to yoga and to my own yoga practice and now teaching. Ryan, I'm curious why you said thankfully. Um, was the basketball career no longer fulfilling you? Yeah, you know, I had always dreamed of it, but it wasn't the most, I don't know. There's so much beauty in being a part of a team and to, to learning to being, to be, being a cog in the wheel or the fabric of the team and that learning and how to push yourself and get the most out of yourself. And that was a great learning, but the, the stuff, the deeper sides of yoga that deal with, because even when I was playing basketball, my mental state was not good. I was super either darkly depressed or super anxious. And it was like, I had a great, exterior but interiorly I wasn't addressing and so I feel like thank when I say thankfully yoga is like caused me to address some of my own to uh, like a compressed evolution where we're, we're trying to evolve into light or like love and so yoga has really helped me and basketball kind of like reinforced injury and ego and yoga's helped to start to chip away at the injuries and the ego all right, so I see the transition from being a basketball player to being a yogi. Now, how did um, the transition or the evolution from being a student of yoga to being a teacher of yoga happen? Yeah, uh, you know, I feel like I can remember the moment I was doing an Iyengar yoga workshop with this man, Father Joe Pereira. He's got 60 centers around India, approximately 60 called Kripa, which means grace in Sanskrit. And he serves like HIV AIDS patients, drug abusers, alcoholics, like, and give yoga as therapy in that way. And so he travels around the world. He was with Mother Teresa for many years and with Iyengar for 42 years. Wow. And this guy is like every morning, at least an hour, He's 78 or something and doing five minute Urdhva Danyarasana, like a big back bend. So his, he just addresses his spine. He's beautiful, Catholic priest who calls God she. Um, anyway, this is, I guess, gonna be a long story. So anyway, he had me in the chair back bend that you do in Iyengar yoga. So, we went like, imagine me 20 years ago at most or 15, I don't know. So in this pose and I'm like freaking out. I was thinking I was going to have to scream. I was thinking I needed to jump out of the room, freaking out and he just like talked us through it. And I stayed in the pose for the in eternity. I think it was about, seven minutes it felt like seven years or something and so anyway i i stayed in the pose he told us to stay it was such a trip and i came out of the pose and um i just immediately started to not immediately i chilled out for a few minutes and then i just started to weep like uncontrollably cry for i don't know how long and it was like, it wasn't like I knew what I was crying about, but it was a um, just a catharsis or something. And I remember being in there and thinking, feeling, oh my God, this was so powerful and liberating for my spirit. Um, I need to teach this. And so I decided that day I was like, as far as I remember, I was that was what I was going to do. I need to sh I need to give people the medicine that was given to me. And then, you know, the being a teacher is a big responsibility, and um, I didn't always take it as serious as I do now. Um, 
so yeah it's such an interesting trip because i call myself in i'm a yoga student and a bit of a teacher because i've been um i'm way more comfortable as a student and that's why i think i can teach because i i practice you know mm. and try to try to figure out how to share it or feel out how to share it I definitely feel like you would do an incredible job of sharing this medicine with people, Ryan. I mean, Suzanne and I both have been so fortunate to be in your classes and have different teachings from you, and it's just um, undescribable. Yes, it's an experience like no wonder, and I have to say that um, I've cried in your class. <laughs> Me too, before, yes. <laughs> especially after those back bends, so thank you. And I wonder, where do you get your inspiration from? for teaching, for running your studios, for connecting with people. From that kid who is here, my daughter, my daughters, I had another little baby and she passed away right after she was born. Mm -hmm. So I, I draw on them to keep um, in practice and to keep doing the work because I know I want to um, make a great life for Kaya and so there's that and you know I love music I listen to music and use that a bit and the inspiration for my classes really comes from what my teachers have taught me and then a little bit I've kind of taken on my own but most of it's what they taught me and then trying to um, get that clear and then I don't know it's a little messy in here, but I've got my um, yoga books. Like I just study and practice as much as possible. And then I've got my little altar with my precious things and the indigenous teacher training that I did. So I just kind of like, um, I know that the, more I can get clear, the better it's going to be for my students and my family and my friends. Like if I'm doing practice, um, I'll be a better son, um, brother, friend, teacher, you know? Mm. So I just try to keep studying and I love to pray and to chant and to sing. Mm -hmm and to study and, and read Rumi poetry. And that gives me the inspiration just to keep eating the soul food of that. I know that for both Nick and I, there are days when it's challenging to get on our yoga mat and we've been practicing yoga for almost a decade now. Yet there are days where we are really almost resisting mm -hmm. those times. And because it is almost like a moment of truth. You step on your yoga mat and you get that connection with yourself. And I can imagine that for somebody who is just starting or even thinking about starting to practice yoga, there must be a little bit of a fear perhaps associated with that. Not for everybody, but we know from experience and working with our clients that there is that little bit of a hesitation what is your advice for those who are just starting out and perhaps are feeling a little intimidated by the practice? Yeah, great question. Well, if you're a perfectionist, you're in big trouble because there's always going to be something like, oh, the sun wasn't up at the right spot, so I missed it. Yeah, but the best advice I could say is if you can breathe, you can do yoga. And to do this, I'll, I'll do one breath and just kind of give you a taste of when what's possible um, with such simple things. Because people look in yoga journal, they think they have to do a handstand or a headstand or a perfect triangle or down. But you do this. Actually, you want to do it with me and people watching. So just get really tall, ground your sitting bones. Lift your chest, so snobby chest, lift your chest and then just kind of bow your head and relax without dropping your rib cage. OK, 
stay and shift your weight back and forward till you find the center where you're not leaning back, you're not leaning forward. And smile into your brain. Now look at me for one second. So you'll drop your head and the arms come up when you inhale. Nice and slow, exhale all your air, drop your head. And we'll do three breaths. Inhale, raise your arms, slow, inhale. Lift, stretch your arms, straighten them out. Squeeze your fingers, stretch. And exhale slowly, lower your arms. Keep your eyes closed. Do two more as smooth and as slow as possible without stressing. Two more times. I'm just inhaling to lift up, sipping the breath in. Stretch your arms, lift your ribs, keep your ribs lifted. On the exhale, slowly lower your arms. Now how relaxed can you make your face for the last one with some grace, effortlessness. Go, inhale, feel your arms float up. Feel your fingertips reaching for the stars above you, way up, stretch. Pause at the top, so tall. Then exhale, slowly lower your arms like a feather, slowly floating down, down, down. Ground your hands onto your legs. Slowly let the eyes open. And so you just did yoga. And if you can make your yoga practice about your breath, that brings you to the present moment. I feel like the body's a great anchor to the present. Um, but even more to join the mind and the body is the breath. So if you can breathe and do that three times a day, you can start a yoga practice. Then maybe you add tree pose. Maybe you add a sun salutation. Maybe you add a pose that you know. And then eventually you just do three or four poses, three to five, six breaths a day, and then you have a practice. And then what you'll find is it'll be harder not to get onto your mat than to get onto your mat, then you got it. And then the other thing is if you go and do this three times, you're going to be more likely to want to do a little bit more. So it's almost like you just start so simple and slow. And then from that foundation, then you, you build the mountain of your practice. So it's really about just getting started and getting on your mat and keeping a consistency with it. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be an hour and a half power flow. Like it could be a three minute restorative lying down or three minutes moving like your head or something. Okay, when you put it like this, it's very doable. And I think everybody can do about three minutes of light movement. I want to shift the gears here a little bit. We've talked about you being a student of yoga, you being a teacher, but you also own several yoga studios. How did you become a business owner? What inspired you to start this huge undertaking? So I grew up in the yoga world practicing Ashtanga and Iyengar, and I don't know how much you know. Do you know about the different systems mm -hmm. and how they're pretty at odds with each other often? It's like in Iyengar yoga, you have to do headstand first. In Ashtanga yoga, you have to do headstand first. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong, and it was like confusing and a struggle. Thankfully, I found Srivatsa Ramaswamy, who studied with Krishnamacharya, who taught Patabi and PKS. So I found Ramaswamy said, you know, some days you could do headstand first, some days shoulder stand first. So basically I I saw this studio model and how people would only do this system or this system. And I kind of wanted a place for everybody to come mm -hmm. and gather. And in Saskatoon when I started it, there wasn't a lot of space for younger people to practice like and to actually sweat because at that time I was really into vinyasa and hardcore Iyengar and sweaty ashtanga so I wanted a place where we could like I could turn on the heat if I wanted to I could teach headstand if I wanted to I just wanted the freedom to share what I wanted and Okay, so whether you're teaching people in person or online given the circumstances right now 
What are the offerings really you want people to take with them after they've experienced a practice with you? Something that comes up when I study with Baron Baptiste, one of my great teachers and friends, and I, he talks about the word possibility. And so the Yoga Sutras 246 about the posture, stira sukhamasanam, so get yourself stable without being rigid and tense. And this is mental and physical. Um, and then make your breath smooth and long, rest with the infinite. And then the next sutra, Tada Dvanva Anabhigataha, is then, after those two things, you will not be overcome, or Anabhigataha is literally uh, to, to not be drowned. So we could surf rather than get taken out by the waves. And so, um, so another translation of 248, uh, is that anything's possible, the impossible becomes possible, and that there is possibility. If you can dream it, you can become it. Like, so what I want people, what I um, intend or invoke or whatever pray for people to get is the sense that they are powerful and they're good enough and at the core of their being they're well and the universe has their back as Gabby Bernstein would say like that um, this remembered well-being mm -hmm. I want people to like get what I got from yoga which is to become myself mm -hmm. not all the time but many times to become like I was when I was seven where I didn't care what I really look like or if I danced if people would care I, I would sing because I like to sing I couldn't agree more that there's so many teachings we can take from children and just their ability to experience live life so present and just play and I think if anybody children are the ones that can take the impossible and make it possible they just don't think of the consequences or any of the circumstances and Speaking of taking the impossible and making it possible, I think what we're being faced with right now, this pandemic, if you will, I just wanted to get your opinion on it because I feel like we could take this as a beautiful opportunity of growth, of evolvement, of seeing the silver lining, and it's really our perspective of it and how we take this on. I was just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on what we're being faced with right now. It's funny. First thing I thought of when you asked me that, is um i'm a really i really love um bob marley he's up on there uh, my altar with selassie <laughs> yeah. uh, with ram das with a bunch of my ancestors and my teachers and my friends who have left um so i was thinking of bob when you asked me that and bob marley his last interview that I could find before he left or one of his last ones, the guy asked him, so what do you, what advice do you have for the youth in the world? And back in the day, I don't know, 81, 80, I don't remember the year. Um, Bob Marley said, don't get too busy. He said, tell them not to get too busy. And who knows what's going to happen with this whole thing, but there, like you said, the silver lining. I've been going to Bob's son did a pod, a free Instagram music video on that was so beautiful. He just put it up with his family, had his kids on, and his message was, "Because we're not touching, doesn't mean we're not together here and here, mm -hmm. in a on a different vibration." And he's like, "Now it's clear that we really, what we do really does matter. Like how we act really does matter." And he said, now it's just like, be positive, because we're kind of creating this whole thing with how we think and how we vibrate. So I know it's not all positive. Well, yeah, there's a lot of, of shock and um, insecurity and wondering what's going to happen. But there, within that, we have a chance that we can get into our center and kind of create what we want from here, I believe. Mm -hmm. I just, I started to, I've seen some really beautiful parts of humanity come out, even 
the way my neighbors have started to treat me in my little complex here and in my city. It, yeah, I feel like I'm holding space for grace that there's good for the whole um, universe or planet or um, our world because of it. So I'm just, I'm trying to stay positive and trying to keep myself as strong and clear and relaxed as possible so I can be of service to my daughter and to my friend mm -hmm. in my community. Mm. This is like therapy session or something. This is great. Thanks. Therapy for <laughs> us or you? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Ryan, we just love how real and honest and genuine you are. And it shows with your classes, everything. And just even here through this interview, you're just so transparent. And we really appreciate that. Transparent is the right word. I like that. <laughs> how do you do it, Ryan? How do you stay true to yourself? And how do you really act from the place within you? You know, no masks, nothing. You just speak your truth. Good question. You know, I try to, I do the smudge. I pretty much every day I smudge, I say my prayers, I give thanks for, for all the things, and I um, set really positive intentions. And I feel like because I put my mind and meditate on uplifting things and pray for, like, I feel like that's what gives me the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about goal setting? Do you set goals for yourself? Yeah, I do. And they're mainly kind of like self-development goals, like being the best dad I can possibly mm -hmm. be and to pray for guidance to, to be that and to be, um, to make the right steps and to, to be true, you know? So if a challenge does uh, arise, then how do you know what steps to really take and how to respond to that challenge? You know, I try to let go and listen. I try to listen. I had one time Baron Baptiste said, yoga is the art of listening. And so, yeah, when I'm going through it, I try to get still and prepare myself so I can be guided or listen rather than think. Like when I really need to get through something, I don't feel like thinking my way out of it. I used to try to think my way out of everything and it hasn't got, it didn't get me as good of um, results as kind of listening and then for guidance or something. I don't know, it sounds hippie, but it's like we have intuition. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not preparing, if I'm not listening to my intuition, I'm just stumbling around. So I do my daily work so I can listen to the, sp the spirit or the, the small still voice according to the Quakers or, you know, to, to spirit. I'm glad you mentioned intuition. We actually dedicated a whole show to it, uh, I think a couple episodes ago. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, is there something that connects you to your intuition? Something that you find that really helps you connect with that voice inside? And on the contrary, is there something that you find just pulls you away from it? It's almost like rapid thinking pulls me away from it. Like I can see myself spiraling and then starting to get worried and getting caught in thoughts. I feel like the thinking mind can be so beautiful to create things but also it can be so treacherous <laughs> i feel like that's the that's the thing that takes me out ryan i had the pleasure to come to one of your philosophy classes not that long ago and i was just blown away how well you're able to just take this yogic philosophy you know ancient text and bring it into modern day words and really make it applicable to today's world. So my question to you is, is there a part of yoga, because there's eight limbs of yoga, eight different aspects of yoga, is there one that you're more passionate about than the others or one that you really, um, you really want to emphasize when it comes to your teachings or perhaps even your own study? Yeah, you know, I feel like 
the idea of yoga as being a lifestyle or a way of life or a code of ethics. To me, the, the part I'm passionate about is something that like Sharon Gannon and the Jiva Mukti people really take to an extreme measure about yoga is ahimsa and yoga is satya. So yoga is nonviolence and yoga is truthfulness. And those things come way before the postures in terms of order and in terms of like, you know, I, I heard a story that in Tibet, the old days that you used to not even be able to do the poses till you had proven that you were truthful and kind and all those moral principles of the yamas and the yamas before you were even given poses for like years and years mm -hmm. because the poses are so powerful. So I'm kind of like pretty firm now that yoga is very far beyond the postures. Like it's a, a way of being. And also lately, I just want people to know that the poses don't have to be fancy and you don't even have to have straight legs or anything, but everybody can do it and get immense mental strength, physical wellness, spiritual guidance from yoga like everybody that they don't have to be able to even sit up straight or be able to sit down they can do it lying down or in a chair mm -hmm. with or without moving their body with or without their eyes mm -hmm. that was the highlight of my last year of yoga probably is yeah. the last teacher training ricardo a really dear friend of mine now um it was a blind man and, and he came in rock teacher training. And so it's amazing. We'll have to get him teaching some classes now. Such a beautiful man. I think that sounds like a perfect example of what some would think or believe as being impossible. And, you know, obviously this gentleman is showing that it is possible. I guess it just shows us that we should never put limitations on ourselves and no matter what that we can really truly accomplish whatever we set our mind on and I just recently went through this pretty in-depth course on intrinsic health and you know it really made us um, put all our old beliefs about ourselves aside and just create a new reality for our, for ourselves as individuals and for this world as well and one of the big parts at least for me it was a big part was to discover our self-identity and i found that process to be fairly challenging i'm still working on it and i was wondering if there is any uh, suggestions or uh, any experience you might have on discovering self-identity yeah good question my teacher ramaswamy he just kept saying who am i who am i like a yoga or to yoga you just keep asking who am i he'd say who really i am i, I just can hear his voice self reflection to just keep asking that's the first thing that comes i don't know to find out who you really are i believe it comes from somewhere deep within but I, i'm not sure but i feel like it's connected to everything <laughs> so who is ryan well, that's a good question. I still haven't figured that one out. <laughs> that's why you're still a student, right? Why are we all are still students? <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it's underneath everything. It's like we've got this thing inside of each of us that isn't male or female. It's not the color of our skin or hair. Um, it's not like you can't really feel it it's like beyond everything but it's like the consciousness that's guiding each of us is like i don't know i feel like it might be the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the form is like we're each individual snowflakes a little bit different but we're still the same essence it's been great Adrian. thank you very much yeah thanks so much for inviting me is there anything else you would like to share with us? Um, yeah, I'd like to share one story. Is that good? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just because we have been talking about yoga and 
self-consciousness and have you ever had that experience where in the old Flintstones shows, TV shows, you had like a little angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And it would be like a bottle of wine. And you're like, should I have some wine? The other one going back and forth. Do you ever feel that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the story from the Vedas says that Prajapati, the creator, had three um, groups of students. And creator can teach through thunder and that was like uh, one of the languages that um, we used to be able to understand when we can feel nature so creator used to communicate through the thunderstorms and and teach and so he had these three groups of students and so there were um, demons there were angels and there were humans and so as humans, we have, have angelic qualities and we have demonic qualities and depending which ones we pay attention. But he, creator, wanted to teach what was most important in yoga. But as humans were a little different than demons, were a little different than angels, they had a little bit of a different um, message from the thunderstorms. <laughs> da, da, da. So first the humans asked creator, okay, as human as humans, hue the colors of the rainbows, mankind or one mankind. So the as humans, what's important to us? What should we remember? And he said, duh. And they caught it. And he said, Have you understood creator said, Have you understood? And the human said, Yes, you said Dana to give, to give, to give, to serve. So as humans, to remember to give and to be charitable and whatever you get to, to remember to share because we are brothers and sisters. And, and so the creator said, good, you got it. Okay, then the demons said, okay, um, what are we supposed to do as demons? And creator said, Duh. And so he said, have you understood? And the demon said, yes, we've understood. You said, Daya, to be compassionate. So when we're wrathful and feeling angry, that we should be kind and to remember not to act out in wrath and rage. And, and so the creator said, good, you've got it. And then finally, the angels came and said, creator, what are we to know what's important in, in the world and in yoga? And he said, ah. so said, have you understood? And they said, yes, you said Dhamma, to control yourself, to not get too greedy. Because when, when we start to get too high, we sometimes look down on people and we sometimes misuse our power. So it's kind of like control your senses and control yourselves. Gods, like control yourself. Don't get too egotistical. So it's kind of like we can remember those things, those important things, like always give, always be compassionate, and always have some self-control. So as, as are different, because we've got the seeds of, everything inside of us so it's like those three things are pretty great things to remember on the path mm -hmm. thank you Ryan thank you so much for me. yeah thank you, thank you for sharing uh, your time and your energy it's been such a pleasure yeah my pleasure thanks for having me it was really cool I, I would have done this for a few hours There you have it, friends. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And just before we sign off, we have a quick announcement. We're super happy to share that we have a brand new book coming out June 9th. It's called Plant Powered Athlete. And we're really proud of this. Both Zeus and I put a lot of our heart and our energy into it. And if you enjoyed our first book, The Vegan Weight Loss Manifesto, we think you're gonna love this one. Whether you're a longtime vegetarian athlete or really just beginning to make a shift towards a plant-based diet, 
Plant Powered Athlete is the smart, accessible guide you've been looking for to really maximize your performance without compromising your nutrition. It's a combination of both of our passions, incredible photography, over 100 brand new, and of course, plant-based recipes. And it's available for pre-order now from all of your favorite online booksellers. You can learn more at activevegetarian.com. Now, pre-orders are really important for the book's overall success. And with that said, it would really mean a great deal to both of us if you reserved your copy today. Thank you, friends. We greatly appreciate it. Until next time, please stay strong and above all healthy.